Today's reading will be coming from the 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Hear now what God is saying to the church. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know now only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. For now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As I was reading this passage, if you are filled with warm, fuzzy feelings, then there's a chance you're missing the point of the passage. Let me explain. I am sure that almost everyone here has heard this, this passage read at at least one wedding, possibly even your own, seen it in at least one greeting card, and maybe even on a decorative pillow. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a beautifully poetic passage about our ultimate call to love one another, an appropriate reminder on one's wedding day, appropriate to put in our houses and homes to remind us to love. But do not be fooled by Paul's use of poetic language. This call to love in this passage is anything but a tame love aimed at making us feel good about ourselves. It's radical. One might even say an extreme call, but it is what we are called to do as a faithful community. The Church of Corinth, which Paul was writing to, wasn't actually that different than our modern day American church in some ways. By the time Paul writes this letter, they have already become, become caught up in trying to be the best at being a Christian. There was a sense of competitive spirituality and arguments began to erupt, specifically around the idea of speaking in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not a real Christian, they would say to each other. If you don't do this, then is the spirit even with you? Of course we know. That doesn't, that's not how it really works. But they had become so obsessed with doing spirituality that they had forgotten the heart of the gospel, which is love. This is why Paul says that their spirituality is nothing but noise. Their prophetic powers are nothing, and their good deeds of charity lead them with nothing to be gained. It sounds rather harsh. When I read this, I think, I try so hard to do the right thing. I try to live a life worthy of the call of the gospel, but that's not enough? It feels familiar, doesn't it? Our churches often feel like they're in competition with one another. 
we too can become so focused on being the best that we could be that we forget to love our neighbors. And I think though, though when we read this, we think, this is kind of disappointing, right? I could do it and still be wrong. But I actually think if you read this passage, there's a freeing message. Because the point isn't that we have to do the best works of charity or preach the most prophetic sermon, have the most people in our pews. The point is simple, that we get to love. And I use the word get very intentionally, that it is a gift that we get to love one another. Author of a book that I have found to be very formative in my own sense of what it means to be love, Roberta Bondi writes in her book, To Love as God Loves. No amount of pious behavior or Christian discipline can replace love. This is also what Paul is saying, that love has to be at the center of everything. It has to be the ethos of all we do, the air we breathe, and the things we give come from love. And this love is not superficial. It's a love that is thoughtful, intentional, and radical. Now, generally speaking, most of us avoid living our lives in extremes, and there's health to that. And the idea of being labeled a radical makes most of us cringe. But this is the call of the gospel. It's a call to love in a way that is an extreme, in a way that doesn't make sense in our culture. The gospel was never meant to fit into our own worldview, our own culture, or our own being in the world, way of being in the world. The gospel was always meant to grow our worldview, challenge our culture, and transform our way of being. I'll say it again. The gospel was meant to grow our worldview, challenge our culture, and transform the way of being. And this was a difficult call for the church in Corinth. They wanted to smush Christianity into the ways of their own culture. And it can be difficult for us. We want to live lives that are comfortable, lives that don't butt heads with the way of the rest of the world. Hear this passage again. But this time, let us not hear the nice poetic sentiment, but let us hear a radical calling. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Yes, it is patient and kind to those who have had, who have had second or third or even 15th chances. And no, it doesn't really matter how many good things you have done because love really is not arrogant. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Love rejoices in truth and isn't secretly happy when others mess up. It bears with all the burdens that living in community can bring. It believes the best intentions of others, even those who we don't understand. It hopes in the face of hopelessness and it endures. Love is everything. When I think about this radical call, the radical call to love, I think about a group of Catholic sisters who I have had the honor of knowing and doing ministry with in Atlanta. Right down the street from the first church I worked, there was a small hospice house for women dying of AIDS who would otherwise have no access to care. This house is run by a handful of nuns who are part of the Missionaries of Charity, the order that Mother Teresa found. The missionaries of charity have taken vows of poverty to live simple life, lives free from most modern distractions. In fact, they only share one cell phone among the house. They don't have a printer. They do things simply. They spend their days caring and radically loving their community. They give to the little they have to do the works of love and caring not just for the women in their house, but for others in need as well. I have never met a group of people who give more freely of themselves, often sharing gifts of prayer, song, meals, care, and educational opportunities to those in their neighborhood. And this giving is never done with anything expected in return, 
never asking for praise. And when I think about the sisters, what stands out to me is not all of the good works they do. It's the way that their love just fills a room. They do these works with such open hearts, with joy, with patience, with a kindness that thick, fills the air so thickly that when I'm near them, I can feel it. Now, spending your entire life giving to others and to prayer is a life that most of us can't imagine. The sisters give so much of who they are. It's almost impossible to think of living our lives that way. But the thing is, that there is something that seems so natural about who they are. I never get the sense that they must force themselves to live this way. In fact, I get the sense when I'm around them that they are living into their most natural humanity. See, this love that Paul is calling us to, while it is extreme, it's actually who God called, who God made us to be. Because love was the plan from the very beginning. As I said in my first sermon, that love has always been the plan. And I think you would actually agree. <coughs> if you think about the moments in your own life that are the sweetest memories, the moments that make you stop and think, yes, this is who I was meant to be, I am willing to bet those moments are surrounded in the most pure love you've experienced. The moments when you felt like your most truest self, the moments are the moments that you loved the deepest, cared for others, experienced expecting nothing in return, found joy in giving. Am I right? Friends, the call, this radical call of love is not a burden to bear. Rather, it is a gift that we are given. This passage is both a call and a promise. Bombi writes in her book, love is not a duty we grimly perform. It has to do with delight in God and other people, even at its hardest. Hear that word, delight. Loving in its purest sense is a delight. It's a joy. It's the best thing that we have the opportunity to do in our life. So how do we delight in people? We see and we know them, just as God has seen and fully knows, knows each of us. Look at verse 12. It reads, for we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. Isn't that what love ultimately is? To be seen and fully known? When we see and when we know others, we have that patience and kindness because we see that they are usually doing the best that they can at any given day. And when we see and know others, we feel compelled to love them, not for our own pride, but for the good of the other. When we see and know others, our love becomes less resentful, less irritable, and more full of joy, truth, and hope. We are in a place as a community that it feels like we can see dimly. We know that God is calling us to do something new, but we don't know exactly what that call will be. We can see that God is calling us to make big changes, but we don't exactly know what those changes will be yet. But as we grow together, I believe that each day we will begin to see more clearly. And I believe that what we, what we will see is not a future that we love others in hopes of a bigger budget or higher attendance rates on Sundays. What I believe is that we will see a future in which we love for the sake of love, that we care deeply for those around, around us because we see who they truly are. God is calling us to take leaps of faith, to love in ways that just won't make sense, that may feel even counterintuitive that aren't about a bottom line. And then, and when we have this gift of love, both given and received, well then, we will be fully known because we will be living into the best parts of who God has created us to be. So friends, love one another, love your neighbor, love with joy, with kindness, 
with patience and with hope. Put away the desire to be the best or the most spiritual or even the most generous. Take a deep breath. Look someone in the eye and see them. Like, really see them. Because then this radical call to love won't seem so extreme. In fact, it will seem like the most natural thing to do. And as we do this work of loving together, feel confident that you too are fully seen by the one who created you, that you, by the one who calls you beloved, the one who loves you with infinite kindness, infinite patience, who doesn't keep a record of wrongs, who never resents who you are, the one who delights in you, has hope in your, for your future, and loves you more deeply than you could even ever imagine. Amen.